All right, everybody be on your most articulate, wonderful behavior. <clears throat> Oops, where is my lecture? <clears throat> so, how y'all doing? You can see the, um, you can see everything? Okay, so um, the reason why historians and books change the chapter on the Gilded Age and call this era the progressive movement, remember there's a lot of overlaps, it's not a neat like, and then the next day things changed. No way, history is a lot messier, thank goodness, than that. However, um, what we're going to see in the progressive era is that all those things workers and social reformers were demanding in the late 1800s in what we call the Gilded Age last time are going to start to come to pass. Not all of them, mind you, and it'll be messy, but things are going to shift enough in the United States where there are some real changes and we're living with the legacy of those real changes uh, still today. Um, we call this the progressive area because that's what they era because that's what they call themselves, right? A historian, I'm not imposing any titles on them. Does anybody know what this cartoon might represent? What's going on here in this cartoon? Give a guess, and it can be a chat guess or any kind of guess. Well, it's like the reverse. Just visually, it's like the Manifest Destiny painting that you showed us. Yeah. But this is like the reverse of it. Oh, okay. I, I just saw what the cape says. That makes sense. Yeah, vote for women. But I like what you're saying, right? It's the opposite of that Manifest Destiny thing, because we still have a woman representing a social movement, right? And that's so common, even though this is the uh, voting rights for women, um, women are representative of nations, and I could get into this quite a bit. Look at the Statue of Liberty, look at Marianne, who's a representative of France, etc. And that's a whole different subject. We can talk about it later if you want. But this is, ironically, it was the states in the West where women and their male allies uh, pushed for <clears throat> voting rights before states in the East. So this is the Western states shining the light on the poor huddled masses of the East and bringing about progressive reforms, in this case, um, allowing women, um, earning the women the right to vote. <clears throat> Do you all know anything about the progressive era that you bring to class? It's the mother country archetype. Exactly, Joey right? Our mother country, just like our mother ship, right? I don't think any ship is named after a dude, right? You don't call it the USS Henry. Oh no, there are some Navy ships, never mind. But most ships are named after women, historically speaking. Um, you might ask what motivated, and here's a boring, I uploaded the slides already, and I know, oh my gosh, it's the worst thing when professors read off a slide, but I really want to just get these few points across. Um, what motivated a lot of these progressive reformers <clears throat> was this sense that, you know what, we are this republic, this Christian republic in their minds, right? Nothing in the Constitution says that, but they felt that through Christian moralism and the golden rule, right, treating your neighbors as you would want to be treated, we can make the world a better place. And how do we make this country and then the world a better place? Well, you improve society based on science. So do you want to improve women's uh, mortality rates um, in when they give birth? Well, you study it, right? So this is kind of a boom in scientific study about all kinds of things, and we'll look at that. And efficiency, how do you make factories more efficient, right? Well, you introduce what we'll, what we'll look at is, um, it's called scientific management or Taylorism. So the progressive reformers wanted to make this a more efficient, a more uh, a moral country, and they were very much anti-monopoly. <clears throat> a lot like we saw many of the workers and many of the farmers in the, in the um, form of the Granger movements did not like all the railroad monopolies or banking monopolies that straight up ripped them off. Okay, so see, these are some of the things that motivated them. <clears throat> However, we're also going to look at, in a couple lectures, the dark side of the progressive reforms. Have any of y'all heard of eugenics? <clears throat> Rachel, what's eugenics? It's basically a lot of like bloodline purity kind of 
I know it's used a lot with like purity races or breeding breeding in positive attributes into future generations. Yeah, looking for, quote unquote, the best in your society and encouraging them with even government monetary um, to have more kids. And then the other side of that, who's going to be sterilized? A lot of disabled people, a lot of uh, people of color, a lot of, I I've seen, I, I read this thing about this that was saying that um, in England, when it was prop, when it was popular, they sterilized a lot of like poor people that didn't have like any real medical or issue. It's just that they were clearly they had something wrong with them, or else they'd be rich. So, yeah, yeah exactly right. And it's um, so you know who studied a lot about U.S. eugenics was the Nazis, right? Not surprisingly. Yeah. So we're also going to look at um, the dark side of this these progressive quote unquote progressive reforms. Let me tell you a story. Now let's tell a story. Isn't this a, a beautiful photo of this uh, Nellie Bly? So the first question I'm going to be asking you in assignment two is what strikes you about the muckrakers? They call themselves muckrakers because they went through the muck and exposed the nastiness of it. So what um, Nellie Bly did was she was interesting. <clears throat> She was interested in reforming the quote unquote lunatic asylums or madhouses for women, right? She herself was not, uh, not institutionalized in a quote unquote madhouse, but she knew many people who were in New York and she heard of the horrific conditions. And a couple of my students last semester told me there's a TV series called American Horror Story or something, uh, something like that. And they actually did a whole show in which they did a fictionalized version of her story, Nellie Bly's story. So in 1880, um, when was it? Yeah, in the 1880s, she got herself admitted. She pretended right she was insane. And by the way, um, how did many women get <clears throat> diagnosed as being insane, do you think, back in those days? Marital disobedience. Yeah, like if the husband wanted the wife out and he had enough connections, boom, she's insane, man, take her away. And she would, right? Exactly. Marriage, marriage disobedience, well. Oh. It's scientific witch hunting, essentially. Yeah. <clears throat> um, so what she did was she faked her insanity, right? And went undercover and spent 10 days and here's the building, 10 days in this, uh, forget all the words, the words you can see um, in the slides, 10 days in this institution, do you see the cages on the uh, balconies, right? It looks like a pretty oppressive place, right? <clears throat> and she went in and um, she drew about, she documented the abuses, right? The physical abuses, the mental abuses, the isolation that many of these uh, young women were experiencing. Also, the corruption that this institution practiced. In other words, a lot of the money that went into the institution didn't go towards the, uh, feeding them better, better or paying nurses, but went into the pockets of the doctors and the quote-unquote doctors and administrators of this institution. So in this long scathing report, she talks about the abuses, the corruption, all this stuff. And there was a publishing company, right, who asked her to do it, who supported her efforts, and they actually helped to get her out of there after 10 days, right? <clears throat> and do you think it worked a little? Do you think it worked? What do you think? Probably at least a little bit, not a maybe little not. Bit. Yeah, right. Again, uh, revolutions don't happen overnight. Oh my gosh, where's my chat? I just want to see if Kayla was saying anything. Um, it kind of worked. Um, her report and readers' mobilization pushed New York City to improve some stuff. They <clears throat> um, appropriated a million dollars per year for improvements. However, when she went back, um, I think a few months later, maybe a year later, to see and check on the quote unquote improvements. Again, a lot of that was very superficial improvements. 
But nevertheless, it was a step in reforming the um, quote unquote insane asylums. Um, and it was just another example of, wait, let's go back to her wonderful. <clears throat> it was another example of, you know what, these social reformers are starting to affect change, right, in very small ways and very particular places, but it's starting to work. So that's why she, we call her one of the early progressive reformers who used uh, journalism, right, in order to affect change. So as you all will see, um, when in question number one for assignment two, uh, there's a link to her whole report. And for extra credit, geez, just read like a page of her report. It's really, um, it's really well written and really engaging. And I'm not surprised they made um, a film about it. So check out her report as you'll see in assignment two, and I'm gonna post assignment two in about an hour after this lecture. <clears throat> Another quote unquote muckraker, muckraking journalist was this woman, Ida Tarbell. So Ida Tarbell did not, uh, what was Standard Oil? Do y'all remember Standard Oil? Do y'all remember what Standard Oil was, Rachel? That was one of the um, robber barons companies, correct? Yeah, is the that right here is <clears throat> Standard Oil and this cartoon's, you know, editorial opinion is that Standard Oil controls both branches of government here, the tentacles, right? The arms of it controlling this, they control the high seas, they control the White House, and they control politicians, right? And many Americans, many other oil companies, were um, complaining that, hey, they're monopolizing fuel costs. So fuel costs, costs are artificially high. They buy and sell politicians at, at their whim. So <clears throat> what this woman did, Ida Tarbell, she used her um, femininity to her advantage. So what she did, she would um, invite herself to lunch to some of the Standard Oil corporate executives and got them to talk. How do you think she got him to talk and say things they might not have otherwise said? What do you think, Joey, uh, Rachel, or Kayla? Uh, I mean, at the time, people probably didn't think women were super threatening or intelligent, so. <laughs> yeah, I can tell this dumb woman anything. What else? How else might she, she have used her wily, womanly ways? Keep flirting with people to get them to tell her things. That's yeah, awesome. Like, oh, wow, you are so smart. And look at this wonderful company you made. And you must be so rich. Oh, my gosh, you're the greatest guy. And you know how guys are like, oh, yeah, let me tell you something else, right? And she did. And it's an amazing story of hers anyway. So she did. And she got corporate executives at Standard to, like, even hand over documents. Like, hey, here is an example of how rich and powerful we are. She went and turned her report into a book in which Teddy Roosevelt read. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was our brand new president. I'll give you a little spiel about him in a second. And this in part led to the breakup of Standard Oil. Finally, important people within the government said, all right, that's enough. We're not going to take it anymore. The winds had shifted in American um, political thought a lot because of these muckrakers. <clears throat> Um, let's go to how did Teddy Roosevelt. So in 1900, uh, <clears throat> the Republican William McKinley was elected president. However, not long after he was elected, oh, his vice president was this young guy from New York named Theodore Roosevelt. The Roosevelts are one of the wealthiest and most elite families in the nation. Uh, they can trace their heritage back to when the Dutch owned Manhattan Island. And he comes from the same family, um, a Dutch family, who owned Manhattan Island way, way back, right? So it's old school American money. <clears throat> However, in September 1901, President McKinley was shot in the stomach and assassinated. And then, to the surprise of many, well, not surprised when the president's killed, the vice president becomes president. Um, this young guy, this former New York City police captain, right, former undersecretary of the Navy, uh, becomes president in 1901. 
And he's a very vivacious reader, a very outgoing, charismatic person. You're, I'm gonna, in assignment two, I'm going to have you watch a little 30-minute um, clip that really outlines his personality and his policies really well. Oops. <clears throat> and with Roosevelt at the helm, at the head of the executive branch of the um, government, he promised Americans a square deal. He said, I'm going to break up bad trusts, trusts that don't, that aren't fair, but he's going to give, he's going to befriend good trusts. Can you see the good trust here that he's not killing? But he's going to make sure the good trusts have laws that restrain them. So in other words, this did not happen in the Gilded Age. This is called the Progressive Era because now government is imposing regulations on companies in order that they have um, good relations with workers, that they don't monopolize things, et cetera. But the bad trusts are going to be killed and turned into bear rugs. By the way, do you know why he's called Teddy Roosevelt? No? Okay, I'll tell you that next time. That'll be in the next lecture. <clears throat> um, and one of, one of the, an example of progressive era reforms. All right, Chris, you've been saying a lot about this. How are things actually going to change? Well, for example, in Chicago, where the big stockyards and meat packing companies were concentrated, um, tinned meat became a new thing. And could you imagine uh, what might be scary about a can of meat? in an unregulated market where there's no rules in it. for companies. It's, you have no way of proving that it's actually the meat it says it is. You have no way of proving it's been disinfected or is, God knows what's in it. I mean, it could be anything. It, and it was anything, right? Whatever fell into the hopper, sometimes people's parts, body parts that fell in. I kid you not, you all are gonna read um, Upton Sinclair was a journalist, and I assigned, I think, a five-page section of his attack on meat packers in 1906. So he's going to read this very scathing and gross expose about how the meat packing industry actually works, and it grossed Americans out, and it was a very popular read. And here's Teddy Roosevelt, right, looking at the muckrakers investigation, and he came to change it. So uh, <clears throat> when you go to the store and see a packaged food of anything, what do you see? What's on the package for any of our food that we buy? A picture, a label, a list of ingredients. Yeah, a label of what it is, right? What's in it, where it was made, et cetera, its expiration date. This is when this started during this era. <clears throat> uh, it's called the Consumer Protection Acts, there was many of them, right? For example, uh, they protected consumers by mandating information on the label, directing scientists to inspect factories, et cetera. So now, for example, it mandated that people who worked in meat factories had to wear certain clothing in order to protect themselves and to minimize the germs. But remember, I also told you that the progressive era wanted to make more efficient meat processing. Look at this here, see all the, um, are those pigs? Yeah, pigs. All the pigs are on a rack and the rack's moving down this assembly line. And this guy does this cut, that guy does that cut, that guy does that cut. I always imagine the smell of those places. I think it'd be an interesting place to go, a field trip, a Shasta College field trip to a meat processing plant, right? It'd be very telling. It makes, every time I think about it, it makes me want to just eat hunted meat, right? Much better. So improved efficiency, da, da, da. So there was the Meat Inspection, Pure Food and Drug Act, and now clear labels were supposed to be on the, um, on the things we buy. <clears throat> Another target of the reformers were drugs, right? Um, for example, heroin and cocaine were targeted as being very dangerous. Um, there were no laws regulating heroin, cocaine, and have you all seen Westerns where this one guy is sometimes selling this snake oil, 
right? And the snake oil promises to cure your every ailment, right? Oftentimes that stuff was made of the nastiest, most dangerous toxic stuff, and there was no regulations. So another target of these um, regulators was to target those snake oil salesmen. <clears throat> This is crazy. Can you see how you could send for samples for heroin and it would be delivered to your house? Yep, and they'd even send you a syringe and a, a shoot 'em up kit. Crazy, right through Sears catalog. I think I showed you this in the last one, right? Coca-Cola? Yeah, Coca-Cola, the original recipe, right? Had cocaine in it and it was actually sold to people as the opposite of beer. So for all you alcoholics who want to clear your head and have a little pep, now drink Coca-Cola. <clears throat> right, cocaine tooth drops, I have to show you this one again. The cocaine toothache drops were sold to families with kids who were teething, right, to uh, numb their gums so they wouldn't hurt anymore. But many people knew the dangers of cocaine. It was very obvious that it was a social problem, right? These are just a couple um, cartoons just to represent to you that Americans knew this was a problem, right? Can I ask a question? Go ahead, yeah. Um, so even if these products weren't like universally used, there was still presumably like a generation or a chunk of a couple generations that had been doing cocaine from a young age and then saw suddenly it was illegal. So did they have I mean, I know addiction wasn't really properly understood at the time, but like what happened to those people? The addicts who all of a sudden were cut off? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, cocaine addicts cut off. Well, this is also, you could say, the birth of the black market. Fair enough. Right, because, but um, you know what? I know much more about the Mexican drug trade in the early 1930s, but this early, early time, I'd have to look into more. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I don't know. I do know that it went underground, right? And people still did shoot up heroin and take cocaine, but it was largely in... Um, I guess a lot of them would have just gone to prison. Like, that's how it happens yeah, now. Yeah, incarceration. Um, there wasn't a big growth of um, reform places right to reform and there still isn't right we still have a big opioid problem and we still need to deal with this social issue we're having mm -hmm. yeah so the target then as is the target now was just to um criminalize taking the drug right criminalize the the addict and the victim of the drug which i don't think which doesn't work um <clears throat> So this is when even marijuana, a lot of people argue that marijuana should be made illegal then and it was made illegal then, even though it's not on the same schedule as these hardcore uh, narcotics or opioids. Um, another set of reforms that happened during the progressive era were the 16th, 17th and 18th amendments. And briefly, as I go through them, the 16th amendment, I bet this is one of your favorite. In 19, before 1913, Americans did not pay tax based on their income. Okay, most government revenue came from tariffs and other ways. Now, by 1913, right, this was a progressive reform to tax income. And you know who hated this the most? And who fought it the most in Congress and in the Senate? Rich people? <laughs> Wealthy people, right? Because poor people were paying proportionally more back to the federal government than rich people. So this was called a progressive taxation because rich people were, um, anyway, now had to pay into government to help build schools and roads and everything else, okay? So you can blame the progressive reformers next time you have to pay your income tax. Um, the 17th Amendment, not until the 17th Amendment of 1913 did us people get to vote for our senators. For example, who's our two senators in California? You can Google it. Google off it. Kalik and... Uh... It's Feinstein and Harris, isn't it? Yep. 
Feinstein and Kamala Harris, who's um, might not have her, have her senator job in, by November. We'll have to see. So before 1913, we didn't get to vote for our senators. Our state legislatures did, right? Because our founding fathers said, man, we can't trust Americans to vote. Who might they vote for, right? Some quack. So, but by the 1913, by 1913, many Americans said, hey, I want a voice in who our senator is. So in 1913, the 17th Amendment <clears throat> allowed for us to vote for our senators because the critique was rich people could just buy their senators. And heck, you can kind of make an argument for that even today, right? Right, like Professor Bob Dylan says, money doesn't talk, it swears. <clears throat> the 18th Amendment pro uh, prohibited alcohol. Boom, by 1920, many of the anti-alcohol reformers who were concerned about alcoholism and the social consequences of it um, convinced enough state legislatures and enough congressmen to prohibit alcohol. The white states are the ones that voted against the amendment, Nevada, New Mexico, Upper Midwest, New York, Pennsylvania. California voted for the prohibition of alcohol. And I'm just asking you, what's your take in the question? What's your take on the 16th, 17th, and 18th Amendment? Right, and as you know, this one's gonna be turned over, right? The 18th Amendment. Because if you make something illegal and people want it and are addicted to it, are they still gonna get a hold of it? Oh yeah, especially this is big mafia money, right? After 1920, the alcohol distribution networks went underground and created mafias. <clears throat> And finally, the last progressive reform I'm going to talk about is us dudes, um, no, you women earned the right to vote. <clears throat> Here are the dates, right? Early on in the West. It was actually, surprisingly, look at Wyoming, that progressive bastion, I'm joking there. Wyoming was one of the first states to allow women to vote. Okay. Why might Western states be on the vanguard of um, voting for women's suffrage? Why, might, why do you think so? Well, I know um, when like California and Arizona, when we were still part of Mexico, women or at least land owning women is I think the rule could vote. And so when we joined America, women had that taken away and we were just getting it back essentially. That's a good point. I like that. The more, uh, well, in my Mexican American history class, we do talk about um, women's power during the Mexican era in that time. Good knowledge. Um, actually, there was a lot fewer people in the West than in the East. So Western states said, man, we are getting, <clears throat> we don't have the representation we want. So let's uh, give women the franchise, the right to vote. And that way we'll have more votes compared to the Eastern states. Right, so it's a way to just have more representation from the Western states. Um, <clears throat> how did women do it? Well, they broke their traditional gender roles of just like stay in the house, honey, and get me a sandwich. Right, they went out on the streets and were political out on the streets. They got a lot of pushback because many Americans said, hey, get back in your place. Us men will take care of politics. So here they are, even with their young daughters, taking it to the streets. Uh, this is a Feminist Day Parade in New York City. They called it a Feminist Day Parade. It's not as historians given the name. And here they are marching hand in hand, right, with male supporters behind them. I hope they're male supporters, not just stalkers. Don't know. But here they are, a Feminist Day Parade in New York City. <clears throat> However, there was a lot of pushback. How does this cartoon represent what scared many men about the election? They might have to do work. <laughs> Terrible. Might have to take suffering your... through parenting your own children. Imagine that. <clears throat> yeah, so many um, Americans and even many American women, there were many American women who were against suffrage because they said, no, no, our traditional role is to be at the home. Right, so I don't wanna paint this as a <clears throat> man versus uh, woman debate, not at all, right? A lot of folks cross the lines. However, one of the main arguments that this will switch gender roles and oh my gosh, this is even a sarcastic image of the Madonna, you know, the Virgin Mary taking care of Jesus. 
It's like, oh my gosh, if we let women vote, then does that mean like the dude is the Virgin Mary taking care of Jesus? Oh my gosh. So this one's called Suffragette Madonna. So I'm going to be asking you to check out a series of cartoons and write a couple sentences on it. They're really interesting. This is an age of uh, mass media and we're going to be seeing a lot of it in class. So finally, in 1919, uh, the 19th Amendment passed, two thirds of the states passed it, two thirds of Congress passed it, bam, women uh, won the right to vote. And there they are. Um, <clears throat> any comments or questions? You know what, let me stop the recording because it takes so long and then we can stay on. Uh,